I'd like to talk to you this morning about inner freedom. The danger with us is having the right answer to everything. The longer that we do this work, the longer that we practice this, the longer that we read about it, the longer that we study it, the greater the danger of us having the right answer. It becomes, it becomes a terrible danger because we crystallize in this knowledge without any realization of it. And that is what makes religion, knowledge, without understanding. Is inner freedom doing what you like as you are now? That's the question that I pose to you. Is inner freedom doing, of course, we're all going to say no. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. We say no. We say no. Inner freedom is not doing what you like as you are now. We say no. And yet, we do what we like. Can you, you see the discrepancy? There's this, well, we know better, but we act worse. And we act worse because knowing isn't enough. We need more than knowing, we need understanding. We need practical, experiential understanding of what it is that we know. Doing what we like is slavery until we attempt to consciously go against doing what we mechanically like. At that time, we start to see that doing what we like isn't really what we like because we see it more as a chain, as a connected series of events, we start to see cause and effect. We start to see that instant gratification doesn't last. It's not something that always works out the way we wanted it to work out. For example, a kid wants instant gratification. So he sees a sugar bowl, a little kid, he sees a sugar bowl on the table, and so he eats all the sugar. Well, he has instant gratification. It's sweet. It's this explosion of everything that he wants. He's satisfied, and he eats it and eats it and eats it until he can't eat anymore. And then he either throws up, or he gets a stomach ache, or he's had enough for a long time. But he develops this habit of doing this, of eating out of the sugar bowl. And then years later, he finds, and it's not even that many years, he finds that he doesn't have any teeth. His teeth have all rotted to black stubs in his face, in his head, and... He can't put two and two together. You know, he can't see. People tell him, well, it's because you ate all that sugar. But he suffers the toothaches and the, the mental image of having stubs for teeth, you know, and what it does to him socially and so on and so forth. As we begin to consciously go against doing what we mechanically like, we begin to see that it's not really what we like, that while we're governed by passions, having our own way, we're not really comfortable in ourselves. We're comfortable possibly or somewhat comfortable in our personality because it's getting what it wants right now. But then it makes us uncomfortable shortly thereafter because then it wants something else and it expects to get it right now too. So we start to develop problems. Following self-will eventually leads away from any real satisfaction that we could ever have. If you begin to consciously go against what you like mechanically, if you can do that, and not all people can, well, let's face it, you have to have some valuation, you have to have some, some desire, you have to have some emotional feeling about it to go against what you mechanically like. But if you can do that, you've got some valuation of the work, you've got some idea of what the work is about, you can get something from it. All this stuff that I'm talking about now is theory until we sincerely observe what happens when we do as we like from, let's say, our lazy side. What happens when you do as you like from your lazy Well, your house gets really dirty. Well, you get hungry. Well, you start to look sloppy and slovenly. Well, you start to smell bad. Everything goes downhill. Well, that's doing what you like from your lazy side. What about your sensual side? Doing what you like from your sensual side. Well, you tend to spread out. You tend to get fat, spongy, lumpy, out of shape, unhealthy. And you get yourself in an incredible entanglements if you're doing what you like from your sensual side. Just blatantly doing what you like. What about from your jealous side? What if you do what you like from your jealous side? What if you do what you like from your negative side? Just from negative emotions. It's easy to say we don't like to do what we like, but we're always doing what we like. And you can tell because we're always avoiding efforts that we kind of know we should make. You ever notice, well, I really know I should be meditating, but it's such an effort, and we find a way to avoid it. I really know I should go and talk to this person, but it's probably going to be unpleasant, so we find a way to avoid it. I really don't want to deal with this issue right now, so we find a way to avoid it. But we know, we kind of know that we should be dealing with it. We know we should be doing this. Something inside of us knows. Yet, when we do what we like, we don't make those efforts. 
something deeper lies within. And until we see this, we don't really know the work. Pure self-gratification doesn't lead to inner harmony. If you want inner harmony, if you want inner peace, if you want something real for yourself that will stay with you no matter what happens in life, it's not going to come from self-gratification. And you either see that or you don't. If you don't, I can give you some ways to see it. But if you don't want to see it, there's no sense in giving you the ways. Rex was telling me a friend of his, a childhood friend, childhood friend, well, a, a friend from years ago, he had him listen to a podcast. And it was a very simple concept. And the guy could not get it, could not understand it at all. What do you mean we're in prison? He just didn't get it. His, his mind was so literal that he could not understand that this was inner, that we were talking about something entirely different. There was just nothing there for it to stick to. There was nothing for him to relate to. He could not get it. Now, to you, that may seem, well, that's really strange. How could that be? And the guy is in his 50s. How could somebody live over 50 years and not get that there is an inner life? There's something else. It happens all the time. This whole world is populated with people like that. That's what politicians are like. That's what people who are running things are like. That's what CEOs are like. As a rule, they're dead. The people who are running this world are dead. Well, what does dead mean? It doesn't mean they're dead. Like the movie Death Becomes You. Did anybody see that movie? <laughs> Death Becomes You. These women died, but they kept their bodies. and But their bodies kept falling apart. So they had to paint them and glue them back together and whatever they had to do, you know, to, to stay looking good. <laughs> It's a parody of life, really. All of us are doing the same thing, in a sense, when we're building up and propping up the false personality, this machine with which we interface with life, rather than living a real life, our real lives. We're under external laws that prevent self-will running riot through fear. What would this world be like if there was no fear of the punishment, enforcement of laws? A complete insanity. It would be unbearable. People who obey out of fear have no internal goodness of being. Because people with internal goodness of being don't obey out of fear. They are obeying something else. They are obeying their internal goodness of being. Whereas other people need external laws and fear to obey so that they don't do things that are bad. External restraint via the law is what makes civilization possible. If there were no external restraints, civilization would not be possible because man isn't nice. Man isn't born with, or at least he doesn't keep, or he covers up, or he buries any internal goodness of being. I know that people say, oh, everybody's got good in them, and they may. But what's the point if you never get to see it, and if all of their behavior is the opposite of that? It's great theory. It's a wonderful philosophy. It's a beautiful idea. But it makes for an ugly world if it isn't manifested. Internal restraints can act on us through the work because the work, until we can connect with real conscience ourselves, connects us with real conscience through what it teaches, through its ideas. We've got to learn to distinguish between the two kinds of restraints. Inner taste shows us the unpleasantness of negative states. But it's interesting that there's no external law against negative states. You can be as negative as you want. There's nothing anybody, nobody's going to come and arrest you for that. The police don't come and knock on your door and say, I've got a warrant for your arrest, or what are the charges? Uh, you've been in a negative state. Well, what negative state? You've been very angry and, and uh, self-absorbed. It's absurd. That doesn't happen. We've got to learn to distinguish this ourselves. Internal influences of the work restrain us differently from doing what we like. So the external influences of the law, they restrain us in one way, but they restrain us in a certain way. But the work internally restrains us in a different way so that we don't do what we like. What a great place to be. Hey, I have a good idea. Let's study the fourth way so that we can all not do what we like. Can you see why people would not be interested in this? I'll teach you how to not do what you like. It's like, okay, well, when is somebody going to teach me how to get what I want? Well, all of life is about that, isn't it? All of life has been trying to teach you how to get what you want. How's that worked out in life? Well, look at the world. Oh, hey, how about that war in Iraq? Oh, isn't that something? We're getting what we like. Well, what about the people who are flying planes in the big buildings? You know? Well, they're getting what they like, aren't they? Isn't that what they're doing it for, to get what they like? And so how's the world working with everybody getting what they like? 
So what I'm saying is, I'll try and teach you how to not get what you like. But see, already you had to think. Oh, oh, I don't, I don't think I like that. Good, you're in the right place. If you don't like that, already it's working. I'm teaching you how to not get what you like. The work, this inner restraint, is different. And we no longer act with impunity. See, the problem with our planet is we act with impunity. Why is it that, that they have these machines? I was, I was driving home Wednesday night, and up ahead at the intersection, I saw these white lights flashing, strobe lights flashing, and I realized, oh, somebody ran a red light, and the cameras were taking pictures. So there was all this flashing, and I said, well, somebody's going to get a little thing in the mail with their picture and ticket for $300 or whatever it is that they ran a red light. And they're not going to know they ran the red light. They never know. You know, so they're going to fight it. They're going to fight it because it's wrong that somebody was taking their picture, it invades their privacy, and blah, 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 blah. Why? Because they want to do what they like. Well, what about the people that were endangered by running the red light? Well, that doesn't matter. This is what I like. I like not having to pay this ticket. I like fighting this. I like standing on this principle of privacy, which is really nothing more than self-interest. It's all about the money. It's all about, I don't want to pay this. I don't want this on my record. I don't want to pay this. It's going to raise my insurance rate. It's all about money. That's all it's about. People pretend it's about principle. They pretend it's about privacy. That's all a lie. It's all self-interest. And I'm sure that'll upset people to hear that. But this is one of those times when I don't care what you think, because this is the truth. Remember I used to say, I saw that film, Four Feathers, and in the film, this native Muslim Arab North African guy says to this Englishman, you walk the earth too proudly. And that hit me because it's true, because we act with impunity. We, we, we walk the earth too proudly. How we touch the earth is wrong, because we're wrong inside. Internally, we are wrong. We are not arranged properly. We are not organized properly internally. And because of this disorganization, this wrong organization, this world is not a pleasant place. Now, this world will never really be a great place because of all of the orders of laws that it's under, 48 orders of laws. It's never going to be a very free place. It's always going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Just look at nature. Everything's eating something else. Everything's being eaten. So it's never going to be a great place. But you can make it better for yourself by getting under fewer laws, by coming under the influence, by passing under the influence of fewer laws. When this happens, we begin to sail above the ground you just kind of lift it up a little bit. You know the feeling of shock absorbers? Of not having everything in life grind at you, pound at you, tear at you? That sense, when you get into that state, that internal state, where you are less identified, where the negative emotions are not being expressed, where everything that happens doesn't jerk your string, pull your chain, that state, it lifts you up a little bit. And you begin to sail above the ground. You begin to float above the ground a little bit. And after a while, you can get to where you can direct that floating, where you actually begin to learn how to sail. I know this is a strange concept for some people, but I'm talking to you because I know you have this experience. And so for you, it's not a strange concept. For you, it's, a, it's an easy step. We develop a second body. Not a physical body. This is physical body. Here it is. But we develop a second body, a psychological body, an internal body, something else in which consciousness resides, something that consciousness can occupy. And it's a psychological body, and it is definitely apart from the physical. Now, it doesn't mean it's not a part of the physical. It's connected. But it's not connected in the same way that the physical body is connected with joints and sinews and, and muscles and arteries and veins and a skeletal system, tendons and so on and so forth. It's connected in a, in a different way. Our psychology becomes more about the work and less about life when we start to develop this second body. The second body is more interested in the work than it is in life. It's not that it's not interested in life at all, but it's interested in life from a different perspective. Now life is something that's used for the work, not something that uses you. Life uses you, just in case you hadn't noticed. If you look at children, you'll notice they're used. They're used by their hormones. They're used by each other. They're used by everything. They're used. 
They don't know that. They're used by the fashion industry. They're used by the people who make cereals. They're used by the advertising. They're used. They're used by people who make games. They're used. They have no ability to say no. They have no sales resistance. So they're used. That's why we have laws to protect them. Clearly, it's not working, but we have laws to protect them because they're so easily used because they don't have this second body. They don't have that. They have not developed that. Some grown men and women who haven't either. After our psychology becomes more work and less life, we know we can't do as we like or as we did like. You begin to understand you can't do everything you'd like to do. Doing this is going to cost you something that you don't want to pay. And so you restrain yourself or the new idea, the new concept, the new psychology, the new understanding restrains you in a different way than an outer restraint. That's what I was talking about before and that's what I'm talking about now. And that's what we'll be talking about for the rest of this time. We begin to follow different ideas. We have a different meaning of ourselves. We find a different meaning of ourselves. We find that we are for something else. Well, I'm not here just to eat sugar and get what I want and have all the sensual pleasures that I want. I'm not here just to be a hedonist. There's something more for me. We find a different meaning for ourselves. We find that we start living in our lives rather than being our lives. This is my life, but it's something that I can deal with as I see fit. It's not doing it to me. You're either in your life like you're in your car, or you are your car. Your car, something happens to your car, something has happened to you. If you do as you like mechanically, you're of the earth. You're glued to life through the senses, which means you're glued to the incidents in life, which means you're glued to the series of events over which you have no control whatsoever, because that series of events is what we call life. And you're glued to that. You're stuck to that. So you go with it. You do what it does. You don't have any choice in the matter. Raise yourself through the work, and you begin to touch the earth differently. As you float above it some, you can touch it where you want and not touch it where you don't want. That's just one thing. You walk the earth less proudly. In all esoteric teachings, there's always a boat, an ark. There's always some way across the river. There is some way that raises people up. So let's think about the ark because that's Christian, and most people are Christian that we know, or they know about the story of Noah's Ark. A flood came. Noah had been told to prepare the Ark, and he took all the animals into it, two of every kind. And actually, that's not how the story really goes. There were, he took seven clean, seven pairs of clean, and, and one pair of unclean animals into the Ark. So there, were, there was a lot more than just two of every kind. The Ark was raised up by the flood. The very flood that, that destroyed the earth actually lifted the Ark up. It became the thing that lifted it up. So the adversity was the thing that came and lifted it. So the adversity for us, the adversity of life, is the very thing that if you apply the work to it, lifts you up. And it lifts you up above the earth. That's why these stories about boats and arcs and things of that description. But to build it, to repair it, to maintain it, you have to like another set of liking. You can't like what you mechanically like. You've got to like something else. When you see the value of the something else, you begin to like it. What you used to like, you don't like as much because you associate it with what it really brings you. Well, I like sugar, but I don't like toothaches. I like sugar, but I don't like to have my body weakened. So I like the taste, but I don't like the effect. Well, great. You like the taste of poison, but you don't like being poisoned. And that just comes with maturity and wisdom and being able to connect cause and effect. And we can't do that without right knowledge and right understanding. So we end up with, a, with another set of liking, a different set of values, a different set of ideas. The work says, work against dislikes. Work against dislikes. I find it interesting that the work also says, try to like what you dislike and dislike what you like. Now, a lot of people think that I am too strict. I hear this more often than I'd like. They think I'm too strict. They think I'm too severe with my diet. I'm too severe with my meditation technique and my habits and too severe with myself, that basically I live like a monk and that I should have more fun and let myself go more. In other words, I should be more like you. But that's really not why we're here. We're not here so that I can become more like you. We're here so that we can become more like the conscious circle of humanity. That's why we're here. Not so that you can be more like me. It's not about me. I know that you sometimes make it about me, but that's your problem. That's not my problem. That's your problem. It's part of the human condition. It's what we do. But it's your problem. 
and I'm going to leave it with you. I'm not going to own it. I'm not going to take it on myself. It's your problem. I practice liking what I don't like and disliking what I like. I eat things that I don't like until I like them. And I don't eat things that I like. And that's one of the ways I do it. Why? Because it's excellent practice. It develops inner muscles. It develops something in you that can help you to stand against life. And so I recommend it. And so I try to get you to do it. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not so successful because you have free will and that self-will can run riot with you and do whatever it wants sometimes and there are other times that you can stand against it. Poco a poco, se anda lejos. Little by little one goes far. It takes little steps, but we have to start somewhere. All freedom is due to inner development of knowledge and being. Knowledge and being linked together bring us to a new understanding. A new understanding is what raises our level of being. You cannot have the same level of being if you understand things differently. When you understand things differently, you cannot have the same level of being that you had. So if you want to understand things differently, you've got to change your level of being. If you change your level of being, you will necessarily understand things differently. There is no help for it. You will. It's the way it will be. As you changed your level of being, you no longer understood things the way you did when you were 17 years old. Now, if you didn't change your level of being, you may still understand things the way you did when you were 17 years old, even like Rex's friend who was over 50. But he was still thinking pretty much like a kid who was 17 years old. A higher level of being always is freer than a lower level. Why is it that children have so many restraints? Lower level of being. Why is it that they have to pay more for insurance, they're not allowed to drive it until a certain age, all these things? Lower level of being. They do not have the discernment, they do not have the level of being to distinguish and discern between right and wrong, or to restrain themselves from doing what they know is wrong, because their hormones run them, or something else, or their desires run them, or their self-will runs them. To get there, to a higher level of being, you've got to put yourself under more laws than belong to your current level of being. So here you are, you want freedom, and I say, well, great, if you want freedom, put yourself under more laws. Well, how is that freedom? Well, it's not, but it brings you there. Just like dieting isn't losing weight, but it brings you there. Not putting everything that you see and want in your mouth without discrimination takes you to losing weight. It is not losing weight itself. Either live mechanically by the laws belonging to our level of being, or we can begin to live consciously by the laws of a higher level. What I'm asking you to do is to begin to live consciously by the laws of a higher level. And then when you do that, you will begin to lift yourself into another level of being. And how that happens is you put yourself under different laws. When you put yourself under different laws, the influence of those laws act on you differently. The work teaches that we have to do things inside to reach a higher level. The most powerful force that we can create in ourselves is this inner doing. Well, what is inner doing? Well, inner doing is not picking up chairs and moving tables. Inner doing is not expressing negative emotions. Inner doing is not identifying with the events in life. Inner doing is bringing the work up to the level of incoming impressions and transforming those impressions where they come in. So that instead of seeing someone come into the room that you dislike, to bring the work right up to that, to turn it internally and see, well, what is it in me that is reacting to that? Because it's not really there. What is it in me that's reacting to what I'm projecting out there? Bring the work ideas up to the level of where the impressions are coming in and transform the impressions there and thereby have food for your inner being rather than have that eat the food that belongs to your inner being. As we ascend the ray of creation, we come under fewer laws. This is why it's important to understand the ray of creation. World number one, world number three, world number six, world number 12, world number 24, world number 48, 48 orders or laws where we are, and then 96, the next lowest place to be. We're just one step out of hell, basically. That's our condition, that's where we're at. 48 orders of laws, the next step is 96 orders of laws. Oh boy, can hardly wait to get there. And there are people who are running headlong, rushing headlong toward it. Or you can turn that around and start to work toward lifting yourself to a different level. 
putting yourself under fewer laws. So what would that be? 24 orders of laws. That's better than 48 orders of laws. But in order to get that, you've got to put yourself under more laws while you're here to get there. Now, we all know that that makes sense if you've ever done exercise. There's a time when exercise just isn't fun. And if it was always fun, then there wouldn't be all these specials at gyms, at fitness places. There wouldn't be all these specials with people, this week only, this year only, this month only. Please come back. You know, the problem is people can go. They get the idea to go, but that they can't keep going because they find that it's unpleasant. They find that it's not fun. It was fun at first when all these babes were there, these guys were there, and they were all looking good, but then they all kind of went away and did something else. They found each other and then went to the bars or went, went, went left and went wherever they went because that's what they came for. Well, they came because it was a, it's an exercise dating service. I'm into people with re really great bodies, so I go to the exercise place to pick up my meat. Great. Well, I'm into people who are, you know, who are mentally loose and, and relaxed and sloppy, so I go to bars to pick up my meat. Great. I stay home. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> so as we ascend the ray, we come under fewer laws. 48 orders of laws is down and dirty. It's a hard way to go. 24 is better, 12 is better still. The ultimate for us is 12. That's, what, that's what's possible for us. That's what's open to us according to this system. But we have to put ourselves under more laws to get under fewer laws. If we act from self-interest, if we act from impulse all the time, if we act from our sensual appetites, we're basically looking down the ray of creation. Or, if you prefer, we're looking out at the world rather than in to this inner psychological second body that we're talking about. Like riding a motorcycle. One of the things they teach you if you go to these motorcycle schools is look where you want to turn. So if you're going to turn, you look where you're going to be. You don't look at the turn. You look where you're going to be, where you're going to come out. And you think, that's crazy. But it works because you go where you look on a motorcycle. You go where you look on a bicycle. I don't know how that works especially, but it works. So they teach that. And if you do that, it works. And if you don't do that, it doesn't work. I remember we were riding bicycles one time, and we were coming down this hill, and there was this big curve at the hill, the end of the hill, big curve, sharp turn. And people got scared there. People got scared because they thought, oh, if I lean the bike over too far, it'll slide out from under me, I'll hit the ground, I'll fall, and it'll be horrible. So they get scared at that point, and they, instead of looking around the turn where they were going to go, they would look at what they were afraid of. Oh, what if I go off the road? And sure enough, they would go off the road. And it would almost never fail. They would go where they looked. Somehow I got it through my head that if I looked around that turn, I just turned my head and looked where I wanted to go, the bike would go there, and it did. If we're looking down, or out, as it were, we tend to go down the ray of creation. And then we become victims of our own appetites and our own self-will, because they imprison us. They don't free us, they imprison us. So that then we become more imprisoned, we become more exacting, or we become more useless. Let's take, uh, I'm looking for an example, and the example that came up in my head was not acceptable. People who do drugs, that's a good example. People who do drugs come under more laws through doing what they like. Do you agree? And then they eventually become incapable of making any effort whatsoever. Growth is through effort only. If you can't make any effort, you're not going to grow. But I don't like that. I'm sorry. If you don't like the truth, that's your problem. I recommend you deal with it as quickly as possible, get it out of the way, so that you can start to make progress. Growth is through effort only, but it has to be right effort. If you tie your rowboat to the dock and row all night long, it's not right effort. You won't get away from the dock. You've got to untie the rope first and then row. And you've got to row in the right way, in the right direction. That's right effort. You've got to have new knowledge. You've got to have new ideas, new conceptions of your feelings, of yourself, of what you are, of what you are for, what you're doing down here. What are you doing down here? What are you doing down here? Well, I'm trying to earn money. Well, I'm trying to get this. I'm trying to get that. And then this is a good place for you. Keep looking down because that's what that is. Being more free means changing our level of being upward. It means having a deeper understanding of ourselves and others. It means the meaning of life and why we're down here all changes. We pass under fewer laws by freeing ourselves from personality. Let's face it, folks. The more identified we are with life, 
the more fear we feel. If you like living in fear, identify with life, identify with your false personality. That's what I am. That's what I'm here for. That's what I do. But we're like dogs that are tied to a cart. We've got a choice. Here's your choice. If you're a dog tied to a cart, when the cart moves, you either resist and you're dragged along by the cart, or you run with it. What I'm recommending is that you learn to run with it. Because if you don't, you will be dragged to death. But if you run with it, you'll get to death too. Well, maybe. Maybe you'll get there differently than if you were dragged there. So think about how you want to die. Would you like to be dragged to death? Or would you like to run along with life and have something when you get there? Well, what? What will you have? We can talk about that some other time.